Welcome back students of NEPA Policy and Practice. This next uh, series of mini lectures are about 15, 10 to 15 to 20 minutes each. Uh, so you should be able to move through them fairly quickly. We're gonna be talking all about effects. Uh, effects and how do you analyze those and compare them across alternatives. What I hope to do in these series is help you accurately determine what impacts need to be looked at for any given project. Think about uh, and map out a cause and effect strategy or diagram beforehand to kind of organize your thoughts and then write an impact analysis that is defensible in that it's uh, systematic and complete. So again, let's review a little bit. Why do we need to compare alternatives? Well, it's a requirement of NEPA and if you're making a decision from an agency's perspective or if you're a public stakeholder or an organization having a, a well-documented comparison informs that entire process through the decision so let's start uh, kind of at the baseline uh, and talk about effects uh, within NEPA and within an EA or environmental impact statement uh, you're going to be looking at three primary types of effects, direct, indirect, and cumulative effects. Now, hopefully this is review. Hopefully you, you've heard in other classes the difference between direct and indirect, but let's just do a little bit of review. A direct effect is something that's occurring at the same time and place. All right, so within a project area, you see the picture, there's a direct effect happening on that uh, vegetation. An indirect effect uh, is classified as an impact that is later in time or farther removed. Okay, so maybe it's an impact that doesn't immediately occur when the project is built, but after a certain amount of time, you start to see impacts. So uh, let's say maybe runoff that results in sedimentation or washout of a road or something. Um, may not be a problem directly after construction, but uh, may occur over time or it's farther removed, right? Maybe there's a, an effect that's happening from emissions from the construction process uh, that's having an effect on a not, <clears throat> excuse me, a non-attainment uh, air quality city or something like that. I also <clears throat> have in there in quotes the but-for test. So what is a but-for? For pooping silly. Sorry, that's a, that's a reference from one of my kids' uh, movies. Uh, the but-for test is you look at any action that's connected, potentially connected to a proposal. So let's say, for example, um, you're building a highway, and as a part of that, you have to have a drainage canal or some adjacent frontage roads. You can use the but-for test to say that adjacent frontage road or that drainage ditch would not exist but for the existence of the proposed highway construction project. So it's whether or not a project exists in and of itself or if it's dependent or interrelated uh, with the larger proposed action. So we'll talk more about these, but that's direct, indirect, and then we'll talk about cumulative effects. So these are impacts that are incremental from any past, present, and reasonably foreseeable future action. Okay, that's a mouthful, and we'll, we'll kind of deconstruct that as we go. And these are both federal and non-federal. So this could be a private land action. It could be a state action. Uh, it doesn't have to just be federal, other federal actions. Um, there's a lot of different ways of looking at cumulative effects. You also have to consider uh, growth inducing impacts. This is kind of an example of possibly an indirect effect. So there's, there's um, a relationship between the impacts that happen when you build a large neighborhood, um, obvious impacts to soils, habitats, um, water, water passage, that kind of stuff. But there's also indirect. So this is a, a, a potential for an indirect impact here would be later in time, maybe you have inadequate stormwater runoff in the communities and it comes barreling into the, the natural areas adjacent. That could be an indirect effect. Um, but in terms of population growth inducing impacts, you wanna think about what's happening in the region and how does that relate to the proposal that's in front of you for 
any number of projects, but you have to kind of look at those relationships. And you, it's important to have a, a well-defined assessment methodology to try to get at what are those impacts from growth. You know, again, go back to the three stools of sustainability. You want to think about it from a social, from an economic, and from an environmental aspect and everything that relates between them. So let's go back to uh, cumulative impacts. This topic has one is one that's throughout my career, um, as long as I can remember, has been kind of a, the bane of our existence in terms of trying to nail down what a cumulative impact is and what's a consistent methodology for analyzing them. But as you can see in this diagram, uh, on the top, you've got the proposed project. Some kind of action is taking place and you're looking at those direct impacts on site, right? Those are direct impacts. In combination with that, for cumulative impacts, you're also looking at past actions, right? So you might go to the historic record and, and look at how has this landscape uh, changed as a result of federal actions, and there should be documentation of that. You also want to think about other actions that are occurring at the same time as your proposal, right? So this might be the indirect impacts, uh, side projects that are related to the larger project that's being proposed, or maybe there are impacts that are happening later in time or farther removed. And in terms of future actions, you need to try to account for maybe what's coming down the pipeline and how does that interact with the highway that's being developed. All right, maybe you know that there's a nuclear power facility on the horizon in the next five to 10 years. That's something that you're, want, you're going to want to analyze in combination with what the proposal is, what's happened in the past, and what other uh, related actions are taking place. Okay, so reasonably foreseeable future actions. What does that really, what does that really mean? Uh, a way to nail down reasonably foreseeable is oftentimes through if there's a, a formal proposal or application in with a federal agency or through the state or a private entity. <clears throat> if you have documentation that they're even considering a project and that they've gone to the trouble of submitting an application, you know that they're pretty serious about that project. So that gives you good defensibility for thinking about reasonably foreseeable future actions. Cumulative impacts are, are a tough one to get your mind around because it seems so large. Um, but the most important part is just documenting how you went through the process, how you looked at past actions, how you looked at indirect effects, and how you considered what future actions may be taking place. So to get into a little bit more detail with cumulative impacts, these are incremental again, okay? These are over, over time, all the way from the past through the present to the future. Doesn't matter um, what the project jurisdiction is. Like I said, it could be federal or non-federal. Could be an individually seemingly benign or minor impact. But when you think of them together collectively, accumulate, that's where cumulative comes from. When things accumulate over time, they may be non-significant by themselves, but together they're having a significant impact over time. You also want to cast a little bit wider net for cumulative effects. You may have a defined project area for the original proposed project, but for your cumulative impacts, you're going to want to trace those as far as an impact may go. So what I mean by that is maybe you have a migratory species that could be impacted by the loss of wetlands that are occurring because of the proposed highway. Um, well, you might need to assess the impacts on that population of migratory species, and is that affecting that uh, population over their entire home range, not just within your project area? Or think about sediment runoff. That doesn't stay put. That, that can flow out of your project area. And in the same, ha in the same uh, vein, you may have other projects within the immediate vicinity that are going to have sediment flowing into your project area or combining with those sediments. And so you need to look at that larger impact. So hopefully you can kind of see the connected nature. It's really trying to take a holistic approach to impacts and how does a proposed federal action fit in with that. Okay, so for cumulative impacts, um, you'll have to start thinking about a broader geographic scope and time frame for the analysis. So you want to be deliberate in what you say or say for cumulative impacts for vegetation, we're looking within this boundary and we're looking out 10 years. 
So you want to nail down what that frame is. Then you're going to look at not only the effects of the proposed action and the alternatives, but how do those combine with past, present, present and foreseeable future actions. And then you're, want, you're going to want to look at magnitude, right? So how bad is the impact? Um, we'll talk more about that in the next couple of lectures. For when you're writing an impact assessment, oftentimes it's chapter four in an EIS. Uh, some key features of that is you want to make it short, powerful but short um, in terms of the affected environment. Remember, we're only looking at things that will be impacted, not the entire region. You want to look at the nature and intensity of impacts, clearly define those, state the facts, what kind of research has taken place, what are the known uh, quantitative impacts of the project that's being proposed. Be clear in how you document the reasoning and your conclusions and what, assumption, what assumptions went into that, right? Because you're never going to have every piece of data that you need. Uh, so you're always going to have to make some kinds of assumptions, and you need to be clear about that. We'll take you through some examples if, in case you're wondering how that's done. So again, remember when we were talking about describing the affected environment, Chapter 3, that's going to be a succinct um, summary of everything that could be impacted. Right. So there, remember, there's going to be a parallel between Chapter 3 and Chapter 4. So these are the same resources that you described in the affected environment. Now you're going to be looking at uh, impacts to each of these resources. So a little bit digging a little bit deeper, a lot of those, a lot of these um, previous resources that we described are more like environmental services, kind of what's on the ground. But resource uses um, or resource good is something that can be monetized, right? So forestry, livestock, um, trails, recreation, property, um, non-renewable resources. Um, there's a lot of mining considerations that you need to go into the affected environment, a description of it, but also the impact to it. You're also going to be thinking about special designations. So this could be areas of critical environmental concern. Um, that has been designated by a forest or a district. And you also want to think about uh, like monuments, things that have been congressionally or um, administratively designated. So these are special use areas. You're also going to think about um, boundaries. So you're going to want to have, um, you know, all of the accurate uh, boundaries and how do proposed actions affect those boundaries. Uh, you'll have to think about environmental education or interpretive signages, and then you'll think about transportation as well. If you get into the other leg of the stool, you have to think about the, the socioeconomic aspects. So is there a relationship between income or livelihoods? Um, is it disproportionately affecting a certain sector of society or a minority group? Do you need to look at environmental justice aspects within a proposal? You also want to think about uh, hazardous materials and, and safety of mines. So a lot of times you'll have, you know, in southern Idaho, we have missile silos, those kinds of things. You have to think about where those are located. Um, are there hazardous materials being transported through or by your project area? And again, the Native American aspect is, is uh, particularly important through the NEPA process, so that's always something that's under consideration for impact analysis. So cause and effect, it seems pretty straightforward, right? You look at what are the impacts that could be happening, what's causing impacts, and then you want to think about what are the resources that could be affected by that impact. So you want indicators for the effect, you know, indicators of vegetation resources or wildlife or, or soils or the economy, any of that. And then you want to figure out what it is about the project that's causing that impact. Then you need to think about how can I document this and be scientifically and um, litigation wise defensible. Clearly document your method and then figure out what information do you need doing that gap analysis. So a little bit more about cause and effect. You have to meet what's called a hard look doctrine in NEPA. So it has to be scientifically defensible and interdisciplinary. So it can't just be um, 
only a uh, soil scientist looking at just the soil section. You have to do <clears throat> a comparative approach between vegetation and wildlife and look at the linkages. Uh, you want to be able to clearly map uh, the rationale that you took, why you chose to use the method described in Brown et al. 2013 for your special status species sage grouse impacts. You have to document that and how that supported your impact analysis. You also want to keep other experts in the loop. Um, you want to uh, make sure that people are communicating across expertise and, and specialties. And if, if everybody is doing this for a proposed project, you know, they're looking at what are the indicators of my resource and how are they being impacted? And then how does that relate to everybody else? You're kind of drawing like a network diagram showing where things touch each other and how they impact each other. And that's really important in a NEPA interdisciplinary process. And if there's a crucial gap, you can figure out, do we need to do that research ourselves or is um, there assumptions that we can make to move forward with the analysis? Now let's break it down by specific steps, okay? We've been talking through it the whole time. What are the impact causing elements, right? So maybe you're removing five acres of topsoil and um, building through um, different types of soils and rock and potentially cultural resources. Then you need to look at the indicators for each resource, document your methodology, look at the data needs. So I'm kind of beating a dead horse here. This is what we just covered in the last couple of slides, but it's really important. And it'll also make your life a lot easier. How will it make your life easier? Well, one way is because you're documenting uh, the map, the how you're seeing the cause and the effect. And we're gonna do uh, exercises of this. This is what uh, the assignment two is all about. Again, you want the same indicators in the affected environment, chapter three, and the environmental consequences, chapter four. Just for review, we're talking about chapters of an EIS. Chapter one is usually an introduction. Chapter two is a proposed action, what's on the table. Chapter three is that affected environment. Chapter four is environmental consequences or impact analysis. So you want three and four to match in scope and detail. And this will help you set a context and make it, make it so that your reader can follow your trail. And then you're looking across alternatives in a, in a systematic way. So let's, let's look at an example before we close out today. You're using prescribed fire to control decadent sagebrush stands. So that just means old or um, bushy and on their way out sagebrush in areas infested by cheatgrass and other noxious weeds. Okay, so that's the action. When you think about the indicators or the areas affected, you've got sagebrush habitat and in turn sage grouse habitat. So what is the type of potential effect, right? You could be losing critical sagebrush habitat and that could include uh, reproduction areas like sage grouse lex. You might have direct mortality um, if there's sage grouse on site or nesting in the area, if you're, disturb if you're disturbing the ground and you may have some casualties from the fire. So the indicator is the acres of critical sagebrush habitat lost and the number of sage grouse individuals uh, likely to be killed by the fire. So those are your indicators. Remember to use indicators that you can quantify and show some type of a trend that makes it easier to conduct a, an impact analysis over time. And a lot of our resources do have available trend information, including social indicators like population, ethnicities, those types of things. You want it to be something that you can nail down and measure. So you, if possible, make it quantitative or if it's qualitative, make sure it's a, an established index that you can use or maybe it's justified by other research. You need something that you can show a, a change. What's that delta? If you're looking between alternatives, you need to have an indicator that will sh show you something. Otherwise, it doesn't have a whole lot of value. You wanna think about cause and effect and make sure it's pretty uh, easy to follow. And you also wanna make sure that you're including in your affected environment and environmental uh, 
effects when you're using indicators, you want that to be directly responsive to what you heard during the scoping period. Okay, so maybe there's a lot of controversy surrounding sage grouse, which there is, right? And maybe um, they have specific concerns related to lex or individuals or uh, restrictions on livestock grazing. And so if there's a lot of chatter about that, it's good to have indicators that's going to speak directly to uh, public or stakeholder concerns. Okay, in summary, you wanna think about cause and effects. You wanna think about indicators. You wanna think about what kind of information that you can use or data to quantify your assessment. And then you wanna have good justification and documentation of your methods. Okay. And then I put in this, this note at the bottom that you've heard this before. We, we have to concentrate in these NEPA documents on the issues that are truly significant to the action in question. We're not amassing needless details and making uh, volumes and volumes of descriptive information that doesn't really serve the impact analysis. You wanna focus on the issues and don't add extraneous information.